we learn the fact that snakes only see motion. And it seems strange to us. We, of course, think that we see things. All they can detect is motion. If you sit perfectly still, and you can test this out in the orchard, sit perfectly still, and if a snake comes by, the snake won't see you. If you move, though, they'll see you. We think that's bizarre. But if you look at the way our mind operates, it's pretty much the same way as the snakes. We notice change. That's what we look for. That's what we're constantly noticing. When someone tells you the deathless is right here in the mind, we can't see it because all we can see is the change. This changes, that changes. If nothing else changes, our mind is changing. It's looking here, looking there. And it's a change that we follow. And as a result, what we see is stress. And so we try to get a sense of ourselves out of what's changing and stressful. And the Buddha says it just doesn't work. We have to change the way we look. He insists that we start with the precepts. Remember that the precepts are there as a change in the way we perceive things. But we start by acting in new ways. The word for the precepts or the virtue of sila is also used to mean something that's normal. What we're trying to do is create a sense of normalcy in the mind. The mind's normal state is when it's not deciding to kill or steal or have illicit sex or lie or take intoxicants. It's a state of mind we tend to overlook. But it's one that the Buddha stresses, and bring the mind to normalcy. First, first by bringing your thoughts and your, your words and your deeds to normalcy. And you begin to gain a sense of, the, a sense of ease and well-being that we all tend to overlook when that state of normalcy grows more consistent. It grows stronger to the point where you can actually notice it. And you begin to think back on the days when you weren't observing the precepts in the, in the sense of this ease, out of balance, out of equilibrium that you had. And you compare it with a sense of normalcy that you're now beginning to detect. You see it really as an improvement. Because the normalcy is allowed to be more pervasive fills more of your life. The same principle works in, as you're practicing concentration. You sit here with a body, and you notice there's a pain here and there's a pain there. And the mind tends to connect the pains in the same way we play connect the dots, and you can all of a sudden have all sorts of bands of tension surrounding your body. And so we learn not to look at them, but instead to look at whatever sense of ease there is that surrounds them. It's like looking at blank spaces on a map. We tend to look at the, the roads and the cities and the words, but there's a lot of blank space in there that's important, too. Otherwise, the roads and the cities just wouldn't have any correspondence to what's out there. So what you're trying to do is allow the breath to be in a state of normalcy. Think back to when you've been in a good mood. Nothing really exciting or anything, but just a basic, okay, normal mood sense of well-being. What was your breath like then? What was the visceral feel of that mood? You could try to tune back into that feel. It's there. Tune back into the way the breath felt at that point. And allow it to have that sense of ease. And then notice where the other basic senses of ease, little spots in the body here and there, that you tend to look past. Where are those? Can you connect them to that sense of ease you have with the breathing? Keep them connected, both in space and in time. In other words, allow the different parts of the body to feel at ease to connect right here in the present moment, and then maintain that sense of connected well-being based on the breath. And at first it may not feel like anything special. But if you allow it to stay, you don't interfere with it, you don't jump away from it, 
you find that it grows stronger and stronger and it becomes develops a real sense of fullness. You can just sit here and breathe in and out, and there's nothing else you need to do, nothing else the mind would want, because you've learned how to change the way you look at things. The skill lies in maintaining that state, both keeping that your sense of awareness, your sense of well-being, filling the body as much as possible, and then maintaining contact with that state allowing it to grow, allowing it to develop. And don't jump off of it, thinking, well, I'd like, I wonder what that's like, I wonder what this is like. It's, this is not yet the time to think those things. This is the time to develop a sense of being centered. And allow this to fill the body. As these various sensations of well-being are allowed to connect, they strengthen one another without your having to push them, without your having to anticipate anything. Give them the time and the space to do what they have to do. And once that sense of well-being is really solid, okay, then you can go back and put to use the mind's tendency to look at what's in constant, what is stressful, but you're looking at it from a different perspective. In the past, you used that jumping from one thing to another to another, looking for something that was going to be constant, looking for something that would give you well-being, and just constantly being thwarted. So you jump again and jump again. That's jumping, looking for happiness, and things are going to change. At this point, however, we're going to look at the mind's tendency to, to jump the tendency in and of itself. Instead of focusing on the things we would jump at, just look at the mind's tendency to jump at this, jump at that, and to see what's happening. Make use of the mind's tendency to look for things that are inconstant and stressful. That's why the Buddha taught the first noble truth. But he wants us to comprehend suffering. That's why we need to have this sense of well-being first before we can look at stress and suffering for the purpose of comprehending it. Usually we look at it for the purpose of getting rid of it or jumping away from it. But here we just want to watch it. In what ways does the mind move that it creates stress? Look for that. Then you begin to see the problem is not with the things that you were jumping at, but the mind's the way the mind jumped. What the way it looked for things, its cravings, its claims. But you look at them from a different perspective now, in a way that allows you to let go. It allows you to see them more and more clearly to the, the point, the very beginning points where the mind jumps, where the mind flows out. That's what the word asava means, a kind of a tendency of the mind to flow to this thing, flow to that thing. And Buddha says you can watch that to the point where you begin to see why it happens and you can cut it off. You start this with blatant things and it gets more and more and more subtle. Finally, you can turn around and take apart this sense of well-being that you created here, the process of concentration. When you can take that apart, okay, that's when there's real release. In the meantime, though, you want to maintain it. Keep it going, because that's the point from which you do your all the work that leads up to the point of total release. Everyone wants to jump to the ultimate right away. Get into a Dharma talk, five, four or five words, and already you're talking about the absolute, or talking about the uncompounded, or whatever. People don't like the work that goes in between. Everyone wants to hear the easy way to overcome laziness or the quick way to overcome impatience. It doesn't work. Laziness is overcome by making an effort. Impatience is overcome by sticking with things for a long time. But the results are more than worth it. That's the guarantee of the practice. 
So meditation does involve work. It does involve patience. It takes time. It takes skill. It takes precision. But the Buddha teaches us to do this in a way that works on this sense of well-being that you can develop by the way you relate to the breath, by the way you relate to the other easeful sensations in the body, the, the way the, the places where the energy does flow properly. Focus on those first, and then you can work with the places where it doesn't flow properly. But always try to work from a position of strength, from a position of normalcy. And you find that that normalcy grows stronger and stronger, more and more pervasive, more and more satisfying. We are on a path, but it's not a path that gives all the good things only at the end. There are a lot of good things that come along the way. If you learn to look in the right place and make the best use of the good things that you've got. This is a teaching that John Lee stresses over and over again. Okay, we've got the five khandhas. Everybody knows the five khandhas are stressful and constant and not so. But he says, don't be in too great a hurry to throw them away. Learn how you can use them. After all, what is the path made out of if it's not made out of feeling and perception and thought constructs and consciousness? Learning how to use these things. What is Rupa Jhana made out of if it's not made out of form, the first kind of? Learning how to use these things in a way that becomes, turns this into the objects of our delusion and of our suffering, turns them into the path. Okay, once the path has done its job, then you let it go. So first you have to learn where to hold on to. You can't let go of everything all at once. You let go in stages. Until the path has cleared and completed its work. Okay, then it's possible to let go. That way you let go without hurting yourself. It's like climbing a ladder. If you let go halfway up, you just fall back down on the ground. If you climb the ladder to the roof or wherever it is you want to go, okay, once you're up there, then you can let go of the ladder because you're secure and safe. So it all comes down to discernment, seeing what really should be let go and what order things are let go in and what you have to depend on in the meantime. Once those distinctions are clear, then the path becomes falls into place.